So in the second lecture, I'll show you how to turn the non-structured multivariate quadratic system of equations into an identification scheme. And once we have an identification scheme, how to turn this into a signature system. Now, signature systems are something you're familiar with, identification schemes you haven't seen yet, so let me spend a few moments on explaining this. Um, it's basically the interactive um, equivalent of a signal. So you're imagining the signer now being called a prover and the other party being the verifier in those cases. And now the signer or prover is proving that they know the secret key to some public key system, but not that they sign a message, but just they're getting some challenges from the other side and they respond in a manner that's compatible with knowing the secret. Now, well, there's only one secret, so of course I could just show you the secret, but then you could go ahead. Also a very important feature that the verifier doesn't learn anything about my secrets while interacting with the prover. Now in this case, in the Sakamoto Shirai here, identification scheme. This is using multivariate system of equations. So we have the random system of equations f. This is living over some fine field q elements. So the characteristic or such doesn't matter for this identification scheme. So I'm just assuming some general of q here. And then the secret is a vector of length n over this fine field. So that's input to the system of equations. And then the public key consists of well, the system of equation, so m equations variables, and the output the evaluation of f at the secret s. That's p. Public key is f, p, and the private key is just as f. Now for simplicity, I'll assume that the constant terms are all zero. Um, and look at the exercise sheet to see that you could do everything somewhat more complicated in case the constant term is non-zero, but for the exposition here on the slides, I'm going with the slightly easier case of constant term is zero. Okay, so then the first ingredient for that identification scheme is that define this function g, which is taking two vectors, g and y, uh, x and y, and both of those are length n vectors. So those can be taking the role of the inputs of the system of equations. So we're going to have f evaluated x at y, and also here at x plus y. This is the definition of g. It's f at x plus y minus f of x minus f of y. And then the claim, and we're going to prove this in a moment, that this is a bilinear function. So bilinear means that you, <clears throat> that you can have sums in both arguments. So if you have g of x plus y comma y, uh, g of x plus z comma y, and that's equal to g of x comma y plus g of z comma y. And you can also do sums in the second arm. Since our f had m equations, our g will also have m equations. So let's focus on what happens, say, at the kth equation. So here is, again, what the original system looks like. So it has n variables. And then we have here the quadratic terms, this coefficients a, i, j because of k because of the kth equation and we have the linear terms here and as I said I want constant to be zero. If you look at the definition of g then you see that these linear terms here while well, you're taking xi plus yi minus xi minus y so those cancel. So the interesting part is from the a terms here. So let's see what happens with these a terms. So here we have the kth equation, yet now in x and y. And so the first part here has the, well, xi is now xi plus yi, and the j is also now, just because that's the first term. And then we're subtracting the evaluation at x and the evaluation at y. These are just like up here. This one is the more interesting. Now we're cross multiplying up here. We're taking xi times xj with these aijs. That is matching the term down here. And same for the y times y. So what we're left with, what remains here, are the cross terms. 
So it's the xi times yj plus the xj times yi. So this is the result. That's the whole piece of it. And well, in each of these k components. Now, when you look at this one and you're wondering what happens when replacing x by x plus z, well, then you're having a sum in the first component and you're having a sum in the second component. And by distributive laws, you can just pull them outside. So you're getting, well, the bilinear property, namely that g of x plus z, comma y is the same as g of x, comma y plus g of z, comma y. And also the same in the second component. Okay, so we've now proven that this is the bilinear function, and so we can now compress this whole part and just work with yes, this bilinear. Um, since I need this later, I want to highlight here as well that if you would have any constants in front of the x or y, since each of these terms has the same constant, we can just move it on the outside. So instead of having x plus z, that here you can also have an alpha times x, and the alpha goes on the outside. Or if you have a minus two, well, minus goes. Okay, now let's look at what this identification scheme actually does. Keep in mind, I'm supposed to prove that I know s without giving you any information. So let's first run through how it works, then show why it works, and then argue why this is actually a secure identification scheme. Assuming that it is. Okay, so in order to initiate a proof, me, the prover, I'm picking several variables. So I'm picking this r0, t0 of length n, so those are going to be inputs to the function f or g, and I'm picking e of length m, so that's going to be on the output side. And I'm also relating r0 to an r1 using my secret. So R0 is random, R1, when all you know is R1 without R0, also looks random, but the two of them, if you sum them up, you're getting my long term secret S. So I must be very, very careful not to give you both R0 and R1. But knowing just one of those, you will not get any information on S. Okay, and now in order to commit, make sure that I cannot change those values. Well, this is a commitment, I'm sending to you, the verifier, these two values. So I'm computing c0 and c1 as the outputs of the hash function, where the inputs, well, the first one is just these variables I just picked, and the second one includes this r1, well, one I just do dependent, s and r0, and then some expression in the other variable. And I'm using function here because that has the feature or the property that if you would change anything on the inputs the output would change. So the only way that I can give you something that hashes to C0 is by giving you exactly the inputs. The only way for me to give you something that hashes to C1 is giving you exactly these two inputs. If you look at the original paper that would say it's commitment function well feature we need is satisfied by hash Okay, and now this thing becomes interactive. So I've now made a commitment and say, okay, I'm not going to tell you the values, but I can't change them anymore. Here is an envelope, here is a box. Well, it's something which has a hash function around it, so I cannot edit this anymore. Then the verifier picks a random value from the queue, the first challenge, and so I now have to do something with this alpha. That is providing freshness to this protocol. Otherwise, somebody could try to impersonate me on the verifier by an old transcript. I mean, in the first part, well, they could send those two values and then just hope that everything will be the same, but Q is going to be sufficiently large that there is very unlikely that it's going to be the same alpha. Okay, so then I have to do something to prove that I'm alive and use this alpha. So I'm doing two more computations. I'm getting E1, which involves the alpha, and E1. And so the one values are just taking alpha times the r0 or alpha times f of r0. And then, well, for t it's using t0, for e it's the e0. Okay, so I've now computed a whole bunch of things. 
I'm also sending T1 and E1 to the verifier. And now the verifier has to do a bit flip. They have now to decide whether if they ask me for something verify C0 or C1. If you could verify those of them, well, verify hash function inputs. So if, if I had to verify those of them, I would have to do R0 and R1. And so you could compute that. So I'm only ever willing to compute one of them. And also notice that all this randomization is also protection to me. The next time I'm verifying that it's me, I will have chosen, chosen a different R0, a different T0, well, same S. But if the next time the verifier picks the other bit, they will not learn anything. You are one, my old R0, even though they pick different bits. Okay, so then what do I have to send? Um, I definitely have to send the R0, R1. So depending on which bit it is, I'm sending R sub B, where B is a bit of a sub. And actually, that's enough. So with all the values that I have sent so far, which are just for the Cs, the T1, the E1, and the verifier knows which bit they've chosen, know the alpha, they can compute the rest, they can verify the rest. And that's easy to see in the first case. So let's first go through the B equals zero case. We need to get something that hashes matching these three. Well, we do know T1, we know alpha, and we now know R0. We know R0 and T1, we can zero, let's look at what happens here. And also here, since we know R0 now, that's what we just did here, we can compute alpha times f of r0, f e1, we can compute zero. That goes here. So yes, in the case that b is zero, the verifier can obviously compute hash, has all the ingredients, and if anything is honest, everything is honestly generated, that matches the c0. Now in the b equals one case, this is a little bit harder to see. And I'll spend a few moments just after this, to explain why this actually should match. But let's take for granted for the moment that this matches. So now, if I was honest, I would be able to prove myself. So I'm gonna check this in a minute. If I was dishonest, if I don't actually know the S0, what chances do I have? Now, in the first case, in the b equals zero, well, the r zero was just randomly chosen. This one doesn't involve any s, neither in the computation here, nor in the verifications. And the e zero doesn't involve any s either. So there's not actually any s in this. So if I knew in advance that I'm going to be asked b equals zero, then I can so I can fake knowing it if I can get information on this coin flip. So it's very important that the verifier does a random coin flip and doesn't tell me up here. Down there they can tell me, but up here, well, here they tell me, but up here I should have no clue whether the bit is going to be 0 or 1. So the b equals 1 case, everything is a little bit harder to see. So it's another of the exercises to check verify, whichever you prefer, um, that also in the B1, uh, B equals 1 case, if you know it in advance, you can actually send matching values so that this one will be one without knowing S. So, if you know in advance what the bit is going to be, it doesn't prove anything. But you don't know in advance. Now, why am I highlighting this? It's actually a security feature. So if the verifier could simulate the whole thing just by knowing in advance, simulate as in, they can compute a valid transcript, they can compute all these pieces just by knowing what way the bit will come up that proves that they don't learn anything about the secret because they can compute themselves and they don't have S. So it's actually a desirable security feature, which we call soundness, that the verifier could simulate all answers um, if they're, well, first of all, zero knowledge, if they could get all of these, 
and the other way around. If anybody gets both of them, gets the B0 and the B1 challenge right, they must know theirs. That is the soundness and that is very obvious here because, well, if you know R0 and R1 and you must know both of them, then you also know it, just as the sound. Okay, so now we know that if you guess correctly, you can pass it. And while it's 50 50, the alpha doesn't actually matter so much for that. So it's a 50 50 guess. And so that means, well, you can get lucky. You can get lucky twice, quarter of a chance. Get lucky three times in a row with an eighth chance. But if you iterate this many, many times and typically want something with, well, have a chance of cheating of to the minus 128, so if you're iterating this 128 times, then you have actually convinced the verifier that you know what the secret is. So the way that this identification works is you're doing 128 iterations of this whole thing, and afterwards the verifier says, yes, okay, I believe you, Tanya, you know the secret. Now, you don't want to do this interactively. Actually, you want to sign a message. You don't want to prove that on you. Um, the Fiat Shamir transform is doing that by changing how these challenges are generated and changing a little bit how the order works. Um, so there is a hash of the message, now there's an H prime, and this H prime will take in all of these initial values, so you have to commit to them or you get the challenges. The challenges are defined by alpha, uh, these challenges define alpha and beta. And typically, well, 128 copies of it. So then the signature scheme coming out of this identification scheme is checking all those 128 versions of this identification scheme where, okay, the first two bits define alpha, the next bit, the first B, next two bits, the next alpha, and another B, and so on, and 128 of it. Right. This thing is actually now a signature system. This is matching the MQDSS scheme that was submitted to this competition um, by a team including uh, Andreas Wilsing from Eindhoven. And it had the nice feature that it was a multivariate system which didn't require any structure, didn't require any trapdoor, so you could really argue with um, hardness of solving multivariate system. A downside is that the signatures, well, <laughs> on the 28 of these transcripts, are rather large. And a normal feature of multivariate systems, which you'll see in the third lecture, if you start with a structured system with a trapdoor, is that the signatures can be very nice. That feature wasn't there. And, well, because everything is a bit larger, a bit slower, this unfortunately didn't make it into the third round. But it's actually, I think, theoretically very, very interesting. All right. To close, I still owe you one proof. So let's go through this one. Um, why does it work for valid messages in the b equals 1 case? Now there are just two arguments in this hash function. H of, well, you get an R sub 1 if everything worked correctly, and that has to match. And then the second part would match this long expression. So let's trace this through. So here's just a copy of what it is, and I'm now plugging in uh, 1 because, well, if the, verify, if the prover was honest, that's what we perceived. And I'm using what we have up here as a definition. So for instance, the public key. That was defined as f evaluated at the secret. No change here. And then this g function, well, I'm for now just replacing what t1 is using this. And I'm replacing what e1 is using that equation. And now we have a whole bunch of things which involve an alpha. And as I showed before, well, g is bilinear, and we can also take out the constant. So I'll split up this g of alpha r0 minus t0 by, well, taking the alpha r0 r1 into one term, and the minus minus t0 r1 into the other term. So let me first put everything on the left here that includes an alpha. Okay, so that's just copying the first term here. It's taking part of what I just argued about, that the alpha came out. So left is minus g of r0, r1, that's here. 
and the alpha f of r0. And then the other part that we have is the g minus and minus, so it becomes a plus g of t0 r1 that goes here. And now this part here, that is already what we want to have. Yeah, that's exactly what we expect to get. So what we need to prove is that this whole thing is zero. Now let's stare at this at the moment and let's go back to the definition of g. The definition of g said that g is the sum, that g is equal to f of sum of the two arguments minus f of the first argument minus f of the second argument. So what we have here is r0 plus r1. Now that matches up here, r0 plus r1 is equal to s. So we have a cancellation there with this first f of s term. And then we have minus f of 0 minus f of 1. And they get with a minus symbol here, so getting those plus cancelling off. So yes, this first term is actually 0. So we're left with just the second term, which is exactly the second argument, the hash function. So also in the b equals 1 case, um, the verifier will compute the correct value if the prover was on. So if the prover actually sent everything matching, if it was correct R1 that was committed to at the beginning, and if it was matching transcripts, so if the T1 and E1 were computed the right way compared to what was hashed into there, everything would work out. Yeah, that's all we need to know about how the scheme works. And then the third lecture will cover it. Uh, we'll cover structured systems, so where you have some extra trapdoor um, in the definition of F.